Hello, all you hardcores today. I'm joined by Terry. How are you doing, Terry? Mate, how are you doing? You're right. You sound like you're underwater. <laughs> what, like Derek? <laughs> <laughs> the man from Atlantis. <laughs> I, sound, I sound like summer, don't I? It is. Mate, how are you feeling? Well, I'm on, uh, I'm on a second bottle of this now. Have you, ever, have you ever used it? It comes out fast as, doesn't it? <laughs> Now with me, like when when that happens to me, Russ, I take antihistamines to just just to calm it all down. That's what I've given uh, dog antihistamine. That's what they get back, don't they? But I know what you mean. Yeah, I know what you mean. That's what I'm gonna have later. Uh, can't believe it. <laughs> Great pickle. <laughs> yeah. No, no. But you know what? That happens to me, mate. If if I if I do if I work too hard, go to the gym too much, I don't sleep enough. Eventually, something like that will happen to me. I think I've ever done it, like, you know, if, if you're at it from early in the morning till midnight, you can overwork yourself, can't you, and think and stuff, maybe. Yeah, you've got, you got, to, mate, you've got to manage your stress and make sure you get a lot of sleep. Yeah, I've not been getting that. I did not get any sleep. Yeah, Julian, Julian <laughs> says to me, yeah, Julian said to me last night, Terry, he said, he thinks that uh, a lot of conditions of people just not having sleep patterns. You know, proper sleep pattern. So. Yeah. So, like, I I try and get at least seven hours of sleep. Like, I keep I've got a sleep tracker which helps me as well. So I know if I've had a a bumpy night's sleep, I've got to make sure that that next night, you know, I lock everything down early and get some good quality sleep. You've got to be like Frotch, really single minded in anything. Even if you're not training, he's like really regimented for sleep and stuff. You know. Yeah, I saw he was with Liam Cameron the other day. You saw what? He was with Liam Cameron. Who approach? Yeah. What were you doing with Liam? Uh, probably asking for advice for a comeback. <laughs> <laughs> Liam signed with uh, Lizzie and Ash next door. To a factory, yeah. aren't he? When are you two going to make up? Get Liam back on the channel. I mean, I, I like Liam. I've got, I ain't got a problem with Liam. Uh, Liam's welcome on at any time. I've said to Ash, you want to set it up, get him down to the studio, and I'll get him on. Oh, is he? It's just catching him at the right time. But yeah. I think Liam struggled in that comeback, didn't he? Because he were all over, wasn't he? But you, this is to be expected, man. You don't, you don't just pick up where you left off. No. he got a lot so, to build on, hasn't he? You just got to, give him, got to give him like a year. As long as he's fighting consistently for a year, let's see where he lands after that. How do you see him coping with uh, working up there with Grant Smith and all I mean, the steel gym? Well, he knows them, doesn't he? From his, from his youth days, he, he knows Grant Smith. Grant Smith knows him. So I don't think it'll be a problem. Well, let's hope he's all right then. Uh, Terry, we know what's been going on last few weeks. We've had uh, John Fury pulling out all the stops. He rants off and then he comes out and he does an apology, doesn't he, after? And is this like a repeat thing now? Because it's happened four times now, isn't it? He knows his role, doesn't he? Right? Yeah. He knows sometimes he's just got to draw attention to himself. And it's a way of building a fight without his kids having to do any work. Yeah. See what I mean? So he knows his role. He knows every so often. He's just got to boot the table in the air just to get people talking. And then, you know, once people are talking, the fight's relevant again. So he knows how to do it. He he knows what he's doing. Yeah. Uh, the heavyweight division at the moment, what, uh, what fights are happening and what's exciting you, Terry? So no fights are happening, <laughs> therefore nothing's exciting me. That's the problem. Yeah. If you were to, if you were to say to me, "What's the number one fight I want to see?" It's still Joshua Wilder. Yeah, that's the one. We I think. Yeah, that's the one. yeah. You know, it is, but it's like we're at the point now where I think we just want to be entertained. Well, there's been a lot of talk, aren't there? A lot of we're going to do this, we're going to do that. that we're going to put Wilder on against uh, Joshua after Vladimir seven years ago nearly. 
So when there's all this talk and then nothing, do you think that that's where they're going wrong, these big promoters? They're saying they're going to do something. It doesn't happen at fans are like, oh, and now anything they say that could be true, nobody believes it, do they? I always go back to something you said. Um, I mean, we were out in Leeds one night. You said something, Russ. Now, I, I, I live by this. If you lie to me once, I have to question everything else you say. Yeah. I don't know if you... Yeah, you said that. I remember you saying that. If, if you lie to me once, I'll question everything you say. No, you know, it won't, it's there's something very similar I said to you to that. It's something my dad said to me years ago, because I've been out on my, on my rally super burning with my mate from Hilltop, and we went like to Tikio, which is about seven mile, and I got in uh, about 11 o'clock and I remember my dad there waiting with questions and that and I was there spewing out all these ex stories about why I were late and that and he said to me once you tell a lie oh else you said to me Russ it's no good so let's start again or it's going to be a long night and I thought oh, I've been here an hour it's going to be like 4 a.m. and I just went I oh, just didn't want to come back <laughs> you, know, you know what happened then don't you I'm going to show you I'm going to show you what happened then, don't I? Hey, Are you ready for this? Go for it. When I do this. All I remember then is my dad standing up and going like that. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Well, here we go. Did you get Did you get the leather bit, the leather bit or the buckle bit? Yeah, bless them. Uh, I put him through hell, my dad. I still do that, actually, but... You know, when you look back. But, uh, but yeah, so he used, to, he used to say, oh, once you tell I hope he says no good to me. So we'll start again. And obviously, yeah. and that's a bit like we Eddie and Frank in it. I think, and Dennis, Dennis is responsible for this as well. He, he comes out with the same nonsense. What happens is you're sat in a coffee shop or in a car or in an office with these boxing promoter people. Phone rings. 15 minutes. And you're thinking, you know, whatever, whatever they've said, puts phone on us. Oh, Sounds interesting, that, Ron. And he'll go, oh, wait, you wait while what we're doing. And that's how it starts. And uh, that must happen to a lot of people. But after about three months, I used to just go, I don't want to hear it. And and it's like, a, not a rumour, but people think so-and-so will be a good fight, and then they mention it to a few people. And before you know where you are, Terry, it's gospel, isn't it? You know yourself, don't you? And I think that's where boxing lets it send down. That everybody tends to believe these people with the big platforms. And then when it looks like it's all going a bit skew with, you know, like this Spencer Brown, Mr. December 23rd, and calling everybody bedroom bloggers who didn't agree with him, blah, blah, blah. So what did I say? I went, OK, you've said it now, Spencer, December 23rd. The fight is on. But me and you and everybody else who stood at this game, we all know different, didn't we? <laughs> oh. No. Yeah. So, so there are always two things that happen, right? So there are things that happen in the shadows that I don't even think the promoters control. Remember, I used to say to you, Russ, Fury and Joshua are controlled by the same person, right? Yeah. And you're you're starting to see that now in terms of where a lot of people are landing. Yeah. So you you've got to be like, there's only one person really pulling the strings here. And if that's the case, then that's they're the people we need to ask. I don't even think Hearn's got a say in this. Because, Russ, let's, let's look at it honestly. You're telling me Eddie Hearn, as much as he loves money, as much as he loves a pound note, wouldn't make Joshua and Joshua Wilder, Joshua Fury in the same year? Of course he would. He'd do that, he'd do that in a heartbeat. Of course he would, yeah. So, so why hasn't he? It can't be because he's not trying. Well, you know what so I what, think it is? Looking at it, going back, there's that much bad blood. If you look back to when Frank got involved with Snooker, didn't he? And he got his leg lifted, didn't he, by that, by that IGM thing with Barry Earn. And I think he must have thought then, hmm, all right, had a little look. And I thought they've never really got on. I think they've tried to, but I think there's too much bad blood. And I think when one of them's on top, he won't throw the other one a bone. And when other one's on top, he won't throw other one a bone. Or as Ern says, oh, why should I give him a leg up? Well, Warren were giving them a leg up back in the day when he had King in tow, didn't he? Don King, because they, Barry Hearn couldn't get that Eubank-Ben rematch on for love and money, could he? He couldn't pull the dough yeah. up. 
Well, Bricktop and Don King helped him out and cut him in, didn't they? So maybe it might be time for Barry Hearn and his son Eduardo Hills, the Iceman, to just say, do you know what? We're the problem here. I don't think it's Bricktop's the problem. Yeah, they've both had a good go at each other for years. But if you look at it, going back the last 13 years, Eddie's been top dog. Now he in. And he wants to go running back now, but they don't want to know, do they? Because there's that much bad blood. So you know what he needs? He needs somebody to grab one of them there, one of them, bang their heads straight together, Terry. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't think they've got that kind of power. I genuinely think if certain people say Fury Joshua happens in June 2024, it happens. I don't think no one can stop it because I, I don't think they're that powerful in boxing. I think if it if it's like a Joe Cordina, yeah, Eddie Hearn can determine that. But there are certain names I just think are controlled elsewhere. Because there's there's too much money at stake. Look, if Fury can drag out an Nganu rematch before he's got messed with Usyk, of course he's gonna do that. And that's that's not Eddie, that's not Frank. That's that the there's higher powers than that saying no no no, we control this. Because Fury, about... Fury would have just taken the 100 mil and been done with it. He doesn't really want a box, so you can tell. I just stop running around picking free money up. In Fury's head, right, when he were offered that fight, they would have all looked at each other and gone, just a sparring session, and we'll use it as sparring for all sake. They would have looked at that as free money, but they had to sell show. That's how they <laughs> would have looked at that. Tyson would have thought, God, this is fantastic, this. We're just going to knock somebody about who's worse than our Tommy for millions of pounds. Do you know what I mean? Kind of thing. Yeah. So, I just think that they need to work together, Frank and him, because if not, there might not be any boxing in five to six years, Terry. We might be really, really struggling. Where's Dennis but, and Steffi Bulls and all their shows? Whoa, whoa, whoa. shows? Where are they whoa. all? Well, okay. So I think we're, we're blaming the wrong people, right? We should be blaming your favorite organization, Russ, because the board could make these fights. Right, they could easily do it. The board could say that him versus him for the British, him versus him for the Commonwealth, him versus him for the English. And then they could just say, we're not sanctioning any fights that aren't for British board belts or world titles. That's what I would do. That should be the rule. If it's not a world title fight, we're not, we're not sanctioning these WBC infant belts, these WBC home economics belts. We're not doing anything like that. We're just going to sanction world titles um, British, Commonwealth, actually put throw the European in there, um, English, Southern, all those sorts of belts, but not not those trinket belts. And see how quickly people have to fight each other. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've seen a lot of carrying off out there. Uh, I've seen an interview with Dominic Negus where he stuck it into stuck it to John Fury. Have you seen that? <laughs> no, what's he said? Well, he were, uh, well, he goes, him and Bricktop go way back, don't they? Yeah. So I'm surprised that Dominic got out there because Dominic Negus and Mickey Fio are really, really close pals. You know, they speak to each other every day and all that. I've gone for breakfast and all that. So I was really surprised when Dominic slipped in there. But him and, like I said, him and Bricktop go way back, don't they? And uh, I seen him come out saying, <laughs> he's seen his son, he's saying John Fury's. Uh, Basically, a P-R-I-C-K and all that carry on. He stuck it to John Fury. So, so Dominic it. Negus, back in the day, because he used to do, I think he did security up by yeah. the by the river near Waterloo. So he used to pop into the lodge every so often and have a few rounds. Dominic's a nice guy. Got the maddest stories ever. Like, was, wasn't was really a boxer, but was talented but wasn't really a villain either, but he was good at that too. He was one of those guys that was just caught between the two worlds for ages. He uh, got attacked in his dressing room, didn't he, and chopped up with an axe and all sorts, didn't he, or a sword or something. Ah, oh, mate, every, everything's happened to that guy. You know, those guys are just a different level of crazy. Like, whoosh. <laughs> I mean, I'd rather just do it, do it in a boxing ring than anything else, but that they lived it 24 hours a day. Well, he stuck it to him, but... Uh... I got the impression that these Saudis, they're not really bothered about anybody out there. They just want to control the top end of the sport. You know, like the heavyweight division. That's how I how it looks to me. I don't think they're bothered about who's in charge, who's the who's the undisputed. I think they just want one 
name undisputed. Is that how you look at it, Terry? Hey, if you if you listen to Terry's take number forty something, I don't remember which one it was. That's why I said the Saudis only care about strategic assets. That's it. Like they they don't care about um whatever fighter you want to name. They genuinely don't care about them. They don't care about Lerone Richards. I mean, they don't care about Phoenix Cash. They care about the world title. They care about an undisputed fight. They care about things that will make the whole world look at Saudi Arabia. That's what they care about. That's why they did Fury and Ghana. They said, right, let's do this crossover fight. We're going to get the UFC people watching. We're going to get the boxing people watching. And then we're going to get the people watching who want to see a freak show. Bit like my bedroom, isn't it? A freak show. I can't get up bed for another hour because it's just been stained. <laughs> I thought this stuff's been put on it. <laughs> I see. I'm not used to being on a bed, aren't I? With all that porridge I've done, tell. <laughs> yeah, there you go. This is a lady yeah, up but... like that, smoking old uh, GV or old Alban. Just there with your plastic mattress, mate. Half ounce for an Osbach. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ongarno. He's Mr. Popular at the moment, and he Terry he's like the go-to guy now. Everything revolves around him now. Why is that? Well, he's a money man in the division because remember he has options, right? Mm. So he he did that thing that is very hard to do, Russ. He he got the sympathy of the whole world, right? So now the whole world want to see him fight again. So that next fight that he has, he's the A side because. It's huge. Whoever he fights, he could fight Chisora, he could fight White, he could fight Hergovic. We're going to see Nganu fight. And this is a guy who, was, who wasn't even earning a quarter of a mil at the UFC. So now suddenly he's a guy that can command seven figures because the eyes of the world are on him. Now, how long that lasts, Russ, I don't know. But this is his time. Like If you're going to make money, this is the time to do it. Get your Adidas endorsements, get your Under Armour Powerade, get your Prime endorsements. Do it now if you're Francis Nganu. Uh, you know, this baddest man on the planet thing, I have a problem yeah. with it. But I think we should have had one fight each in each discipline, then we can determine then, can't we? Uh, there's no chance of it. No no boxers doing well in MMA. Just no chance. I, I understand that, but James Tony went in there, didn't he? And Riddick Bow did something similar, didn't he? With kickboxing, didn't he? Or Muay Thai. Yeah, they were, they, it was embarrassing to watch that. So how can they really say Fury is baddest man on planet with that points win? It's not not really, is it? Because it were like pretty soft. There were no badness in the fight. It was more or less like a, everybody were confused if it were an exhibition, a crossover fight, or just a move around. I, I don't know what, I, what do you think. I, look, I, I I will tell you right. This is how it would go in the in the octagon. In Ghana, we just give Fury a double leg takedown, pass guard, choke, done. But it wouldn't be two minutes. It'd be done. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, Longano is quite a thick set fella, really. I mean, I seen a picture of him the other day in uh, UFC, in, in his UFC outfit. No shoes are out on. His feet are like barges, aren't they, Terry? The thickness of his bone structure. I mean, they go on about Joe Joyce's bone density, which were Sam Jones were telling us about that one. And there were scary stories. I won't leave house. But on Garno's, this is real bone density. <laughs> Have you seen thickness of everything on him? He's a big, big. He's, yeah, he is. And, and so that might be his downfall as well, Russ, because I don't think when, you, when you're built like him, I don't think you've got stamina to actually box. You see what I mean? It's hard. Because in... In the UFC, there are points where you can probably take a bit of a breather. Like if you're on top of someone and you've just you've kind of got that dominant position, you can probably have a bit of a breather. It's less stressful. But boxing, you, you're working every second of the round. Mm. Yeah, he won that. He won't throw in that many punches, but which surprised me. This is how I know, looking back at statistics, because everybody hammers me for statistics, but this is how I look at it. The guy's not throwing that many punches at Fury. Normally, Fury would have been all of him like a rash. But it was like Fury didn't have the tank to throw. So he was like just fumbling his way through. And it was a bit of a a bit of a damp squid, really, wasn't it? You know, after it not. It's weird. Yeah. It, look, I, I'll say it again. You could line up the top 20 British heavyweights today. 
and every one of them would beat Francis and Garno over ten rounds. Yeah. Every one of them. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't even doubt that for a second. I mean, I just you yeah. could probably go lower down, man. There are probably amateurs that would beat Francis and Garno. Probably. Is. So you. So that fury thing was just boxing with no fear, um, not taking it seriously, not training like your life was on the line. And the thing is, individually, those things don't sound major. But when you add them up together and then you work it out day after day after day after day, man, you know, and then you jump in the ring with a the, with the guy in Black and Ghana who's, who's genuinely like petrified. He's like, oh, my God, I might get knocked out here. So he's fighting at his absolute limit and Fury's not. Mm. Yeah, I just didn't think Fury threw enough. And it, it, in fact, if you want to go on his statistics, right, Fury threw, threw 63% less per round. 63% less per round than he did against, you know, Wilder and Derek Chisora, people like that. So what's happened in that 11 month? Has he trained? Is he putting 30 second uh, videos on Insta, jogging with his dad, dad saying, yeah, oh, man, the out, pop, pop, bang. Is that just doing it to say to us he's taking it serious when really he ain't training because you can't tell me he had out of camp in that, in that. You can't, can you, Terry? No, nah, I, I heard from people there that it wasn't, it wasn't as serious as it should have been. That's what I heard. And I heard this before the fight. I heard it was just, it was just a bit of a laugh. Um, they just wanted to get the money and, and move on. It looked like everybody but, was having a good time out there, didn't it? On Fury's yeah. expense or off, off Fury's I, steam. You know yeah, I, mean? I have a feeling, if I'm being honest, I have a feeling that come come the Usyk fight, it's a different Tyson Fury. Mm. Uh, Joshua. He's in limbo now. He's probably, in my opinion, I think he's at the crossroads of his career now, Terry, that the next fight he has... Is going to be the most important matched fight of his life. Do you agree? Yes, and hopefully it's for the same reasons as you, Russ, in that if he fights a guy like Otto Wallen in December or January, that doesn't do wonders for his brand. So I think if I'm Hearn, I'm doing Joshua Ruiz 3. That's got to be AJ's next fight. Because if you can't get Wilder, you can't get Fury, you can't get Usyk, the only other fight that makes sense is Joshua Ruiz. They're not one that Ruiz is in shape, will they? But he had, but like you said, he has to go through them. He's got to have a test before he gets to Fury, hasn't he, or Wilder? He's got to show he can go to war. Yeah, well, he's got to show that old Femi is in there. That that Vladimir Klitschko Femi is in there still. He's got to show that you know there's a bit more aggression to him than we've given him credit for because if he doesn't do that I don't think he I, I don't think he gets out of the O2 I think he's reduced to fighting in the O2 now yeah and struggling to sell it out yeah if he doesn't fight someone that we want to see like an, like an Andy Ruiz it'll be the O2 for the rest of his career so at some point he's got to roll the dice do you think that when he was selling out arenas and selling out stadiums and that do you think that them Taking him to New York and then Saudi and him losing belts. Do you think that's damaged his following? Because, like, it was bursting at seams to sell out stadiums. And now the comping loads, aren't they? But they won't comp any before. Do you remember when it were hard to get a comp ticket off him unless you had a massive following, you know, back in the day? Yeah. But I think if you, if you look at it, Russ, people got behind Joshua because they thought this guy could end up being our version of Mike Tyson. That's why he was selling out arenas. It was like, I think this guy could wipe out everybody. You know, Hearn was like, road to undisputed. Joshua might actually retire undefeated. And and these messages were all over the boxing universe, right? And people bought into it. They said, actually, he looks the part. And you know, when someone looks the part, you want to believe in them. And so that worked well up until Klitschko. And then he fought Takam. And that was a bit questionable. And then he fought kind of those B-list heavyweights like Parker and Povetkin. And he wasn't decisive enough in those for us to believe. And as you notice, his commercial power has been waning ever since. And then that's why they took him to America, right? Let's get him to America now because there's money here. 
And Andy Ruiz said, <laughs> we'll see about that. And Andy Ruiz did what he did. And now, since then, Joshua's been in this weird space of trying to convince the world he's the number one heavyweight, but none of his performances back it up. Do you think that Joshua really like he's another Michael Grant? Although when Michael Grant were coming through and he were like, what, 31 and 0 and all that, he ran into Lennox Lewis, didn't he? Joshua's promoter wouldn't have done that. It took him other routes and he, he's been navigated through choppy waters. Whereas Michael Grant, he were like the Joshua of his day. He he couldn't get you couldn't get away with it in them days, could you? Do you remember? Uh, um many many people did. Like, and I know I'm gonna get roasted in the comments for this. I wonder what, what social media would think of someone like Golotta today, for example, right? Like who? Golotta. Gilotta, well, he beat Riddick Bow twice, didn't he? But he's on stupid and has cost, he lost him the fights, didn't he? Yeah, but you know on social media, someone like Gilotta would get roasted. Mm. Um, they'd be roasting Ray Mercer. They'd, they'd, they'd find reasons to hate on guys like Michael Bent, Michael Grant, etc. So it's really, really hard to compare eras because I wonder what people would have said back then. What would but the FBI have done now? He'd have been dangerous, wouldn't he? <sighs> Yeah, I would have just said he's a small man. <laughs> nice saying that, isn't it? <laughs> no, but ABI, like, although although uh, he had about two brain cells and he said he was pretty lethal, one of the early doors, you know, as an heavyweight. Yeah, he's a small guy, explosive, could crack, um, was mad enough to have a tear up with you. All the things you'd want to see now, but I just think, Russ, if you look at boxing now, it's just a softer generation, physically and emotionally, just softer. Um, kids don't run around anymore. They don't climb trees. They don't fall out of trees and get hurt and uh, learn how to overcome stuff. They don't hang off stuff. So well, by the time they get to 12, 13, they've all just been sat at home playing video games. They're soft. They're, they're just soft to the touch. They cry a lot. Um, they've all been kind of mothered to death. And so when they come into uh, boxing gyms now, they're big and they're strong, by the way. Let's be clear about this. They're big and they're strong. They can throw big punches. Yeah, Some of these kids can crack. But when it comes back at them, they just buckle. They can't take it. And, yeah. and, and that's what we've got in this era. Sorry. Do you think that this is in matchmaking, Terry? This why fighters, they're having these gimme fights. And then when there's, they're having easy gimme ones, and then they step up and the bridge is too far. We can name many like that. Do, they, do you think they need them bridging fights? You they know? should be fighting each other. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, like, we've spoke for a few years now about there being like a Super 6 tournament in the UK for 175 pound guys like Evis. And yeah. then them guys will be more seasoned when they're going for your Kovalevs, you know, your beta beeves and guys like that, you know? just you, you, So, yes and no. So, that's assuming that they learn from these fights, right? I, I've said it numerous times. I don't think we've got the kind of trainers that can build fighters that can have a a 20 defense run as a champion. I I don't know who those trainers are. Maybe Joe G is one of the guys who can do it. But building a guy that can have a, a 20 fight run like Nazim Richardson or going further back, guys like Eddie Fudge. You know those guys who built fighters that lasted? Yeah. We don't seem to have that. So I don't know if the Super 6 would make them more seasoned. It will make them more experienced, but I don't think it would improve them. <clears throat> I think they'd still lose at the top level. Yeah. 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 I, I just... Mm. Because there are so many things that go into being a, a top champion. You can do all the running in the world. You can be in the gym every day. You can sleep eight hours a day. But you've got to be building knowledge on top of knowledge on top of experience. You have to keep developing. And I always put it down to two things. And this is what separates good trainers from great trainers. There's a clear focus and there's an obsession with detail. And I don't see that in the UK at the moment. No, you know, no. I see coaches jump on the internet and they just do a drill because they saw it on the internet. They don't understand why the other coach is doing it because they don't have the humility to go and ask the other coach why are you doing this 
yeah. and as trainers, we don't talk. I find that really weird, Russ. So I'll give you an example. Right? In rugby, let's say I was coaching... Um, I, look, I know you've got a northern base. Let's say I was coaching Featherstone, right? Yeah. I'd go down. I'd go down to Wigan. I know, I'd ring someone like a Chris Bradlinski and say, look, can I come and watch you guys train? I just want to pick, pick some brains about some stuff. And I'd be welcomed. And after the session, we'd sit and we'd talk. Okay, so when you've got a three-on-two here, how do you defend that three-on-two? Or how do you attack that three-on-two? Play around with salt shakers, all of that sort of stuff. But that knowledge is getting shared. Mm. In boxing, that doesn't happen. Coaches don't sit together and go, actually, in this fight, um, we knew he had a really strong right uppercut. So here's what we did to, to manage it. We don't share knowledge like that. Mm. So we don't get better. Yeah. Do you want to go on to part two, Carl? No worries, mate.